Um, as Kevin mentioned, I am a scientist. I am a neuroscientist, to be precise. And um, my background is very much biology, neuroscience, nuclear medicine. And I, I never thought that I would be here today talking about food. But I am. And I'm very happy to get a chance to tell you how that came to me and why I believe that what we put into our bodies is so important for health, especially for brain health. So just to follow up on the previous talks, we do believe that synthetic biology is great, especially in space. But here on Earth, I have to say that human biology remains largely mysterious. Especially in my field, in medicine, we still have a really hard time treating disease and curing disease and even just preserving health. So before we, we start crispering our genes or eating meat from bats, we kind of owe it to ourselves to really understand nature before we try to transcend it. And that's really important um, in order to preserve health and really maintain health and optimize for health because we are an aging population. So this is some good news from the world, which doesn't happen so frequently nowadays, but we do live longer. And that's really important to take into account because uh, longer lives are not necessarily healthier lives. And for so many people, getting older is really associated with an increased risk of disease, especially brain diseases like Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common form of dementia in the world. We have long been saying that we are facing an Alzheimer's disease epidemic. So of all the challenges to aging in our century, nothing compares to the unprecedented scale of Alzheimer's disease. We now have 46 million patients affected with Alzheimer's worldwide. And these numbers are expected to triple by the year 2050, with a projected 130 million Alzheimer's patients all over the world, which is a staggering number. In the United States alone, we are expecting 15 million Alzheimer's patients in the next 20, 30 years, which is really the populations of New York and Chicago and Los Angeles put together, or one and a half Swedens, to put it in current, in current currency. And that's really a lot of people, if you've never been, if you've ever been to any of the cities, and that doesn't even take into account all the patients with different forms of cognitive impairment, different degrees of cognitive impairment or cognitive decline, and then there's going to be all the people who are going to have to take care of them. So we're really facing a global health crisis. And the major challenge for us uh, as clinicians is that we don't really have treatments for Alzheimer's or cognitive aging at large. We do have some drugs. I believe in, in Europe, uh, Aricept or Donepezil is the most commonly used drug. And these are called symptomatic drugs because they do address the symptoms, they make them better for a little bit, but they can't really stop disease progression. So, so many scientists and pharmaceutical companies are now trying to develop disease-modifying drugs for dementia. And these drugs are engineered to act like vaccines, so they're literally aimed at getting rid of the Alzheimer's from inside your brain. And that would be fantastic, the problem being all clinical trials so far failed. So we kind of don't really have cures, which really begs the question, what are we doing wrong? We've been working in this field for so long. So many people have been trying to cure Alzheimer's or prevent brain aging or optimize brain aging, and we just don't quite know what to do. So I think, as with all problems, our approach to a disease, any disease, is really determined by what we understand the problem to be. And here in the background, I'm, I'm showing um, the salient witch trial. I believe you may be familiar with that. So what happened is that in 1692, in Salem, Massachusetts, a number of women were rounded up and accused of being possessed by the devil. They were exhibiting strange or odd behaviors. They would be seen dancing at night. Their cognition was a little bit off. And so the solution back then to this problem was to call the church and have them hanged. We do know now that those women, some of the first uh, witches, so-called, were most likely suffering from a brain disease called Huntington's disease, or chorea of Huntington, which is a neurodegenerative disease that attacks your brain centers and um, shifts your behavior and really leads to uncontrolled movements and, and a loss of cognitive functionality. So we just started to understand what things really are in medicine and how things that we don't fully understand the shape or our understanding of what the disease is or is not. Which brings me back to the original question, 
with millions of future patients with Alzheimer's worldwide, what do we think Alzheimer's is? How can we reconceptualize this disease in a way that makes it addressable? And um, when I first started in the field, most people understood Alzheimer's as the consequence of bad genes in your DNA, or aging, or both, of course. And it turns out that neither of these alternatives is actually the case, if you will. So um, on one hand, there's this semi-fiction of genetic determinism that there's a persistent sense that, that disease is something that we carry in our DNA, that we're born with it, that if your mom has it or your dad has it, you're going to get it too. And for some people, that is true. There are genetic mutations that lead patients to develop Alzheimer's disease, but they're really found in less than 1% of the population. So it's not as frequent as we, as we previously thought it was. And that really means that genes are not your destiny for the vast majority of us, but rather we should start thinking about the polygenic nature of life. So genes don't work in isolation. Genes work in networks. And when you design biology, when you design life, it's something really important to think about. Some of these genetic networks make you sick or predispose you or increase your risk of disease, whereas others really keep you healthy. So there's the first thing to keep in mind. The other thing is the myth of age-related determinism. For many patients, even my own patients, when they walk in the door, they'll just say, oh, you know, I feel like if I live long enough, eventually I'll get dementia. And that's really also not the case. There is no linear path for any of us, and getting older does not mean a route to unavoidable dementia. In fact, we actually learned just recently that Alzheimer's is not an old person's disease. We tend to associate it with old age because that's when the symptoms become manifest. But all the brain changes that lead eventually to Alzheimer's start in midlife. And by midlife, I don't mean 60, I mean 40, 50. But definitely much earlier than we ever thought it would be. So Alzheimer's technically is a middle-aged person disease. And there are three factors that really determine our risk of getting Alzheimer's or other forms of cognitive impairment as well, or just cognitive decline. And these are genes, what you have in your DNA, so all the genes that work together, the environment and lifestyle. It's really the combination of these three factors that determine whether you're going to age gracefully and go down the yellow line uh, with your mental capacities intact, or if you're going to, down, going to go down the slope towards dementia and loss of independent function. So it's really about genetics, environment, and lifestyle, and they all start when you're born. So that's really a different way to think about uh, the brain. And it really speaks to the fact that the brain is not a black box that is magically housed in our skull, but rather is a system that interacts with the rest of the body and the rest of the world over a lifetime. So there's really, this is something that we're beginning to understand thanks to technology, which I believe is why I'm here today. I'm obviously much more into medical technology, but I think it's largely exportable and it's definitely interesting. There are two technologies that really made it possible to understand the interactions between the brain and all the many complex systems around it. And the first one that comes to mind is genomics. And Kevin, my husband, always says cheap genomics. And I'm always like, there's nothing cheap about it, I can assure you. I mean, it's much more affordable than 10 years ago, but it would be nicer to, to bring them down even a little bit more. And this, it's not even just genomics. Your genes are important, but everything that comes downstream of your genes is just as interesting for us. So it's all the omics that go with that. Transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics. We're now in a position to really measure them all which is wonderful. And the other technology is what I really do for, for a living is my background, um, brain scans or brain imaging. And those are incredible because you can really look into a people's head, you, know, you can see a person's brain the first moment they walk in the door at the office and we can see what happens in living brain function uh, over time and also before disease. So that's how we're capturing uh, the brain changes that eventually lead to Alzheimer's when people are in their 40s and 50s. We look at their brains. And it's really the combination of these two factors, genetic predisposition and being able to look into, inside the person's brain, that reveal that Alzheimer's disease is actually largely preventable. And whenever we talk about prevention in medicine, it's pretty much a revolution. Many people just don't use the term. But it looks like uh, there's consensus that over a third 
of all Alzheimer's cases worldwide could be potentially prevented by addressing modifiable risk factors. And that means that there are factors we can't touch. Your DNA, for now, we can't touch it. Your age, we can't touch. Your chromosomal sex, can't touch. Your family, can't change your family. But there are factors we can address by means of medical care, appropriate medical care, and lifestyle interventions. And these are not limited to, but uh, the most important are cardiovascular health, diabetes, obesity, depression, smoking, exercise, intellectual activity, and I underline diet because there's emerging consensus that diet is, is perhaps the one factor that really affects your brain in midlife, together with everything else, but especially diet seems to, to play a huge role in the health of your brain. Now, the thing is that, at least in the United States, we usually associate diets with the way we look and what kind of clothing will fit. But in reality, diet changes your body as well as your brain. So it doesn't just change, doesn't just change the way you look, it really also changes the way we think, which is really important to consider because uh, the brain is built on food. I don't know if anybody has ever studied biochemistry here, but biochemistry is really about brain nutrition. Uh, the brain relies 100% on nutrients for energy, for functionality, and even for structure. There are so many nutrients that just, when you eat them, they really become the fabric of your brain. And that's interesting, when you eat a brownie or a burger, it really makes you think. Um, what's interesting is that the brain has different criteria than the rest of the body. By and large, whenever you eat something, it will go somewhere inside your body, but not necessarily inside your brain. And that's because the brain comes with a blood-brain barrier. So it's literally a shield that separates the, the brain from the rest of the body. And then the brain will just open some gates inside the barrier when the brain itself is hungry and will bring the nutrients in. Now, not all nutrients can get inside your brain, just very, very few can. And those are uh, on top, to the left. So these are the nutrients that can get inside your brain. And these are glucose, a simple sugar vitamins and minerals, some amino acids from protein, uh, a very specific kind of fat called polyunsaturated fat, like the omega-3 fatty acids that we talk about all the time, and something called ketone bodies, and I'll tell you more about this in just a second. Um, to the right, those are the nutrients that can get inside your brain. So whenever you read a book or read in a magazine that these nutrients, like eating a lot of fat, will make you smarter or funnier or healthier, those nutrients just can't get inside your brain. And these are cholesterol, saturated fat, except in kids, uh, transaturated fats, any carbs except glucose, and non-essential amino acids. Uh, so this is important for biochemists, but really we're now in a position to put this knowledge in practice by using the technologies I mentioned before to look at the neurological effects of food. Food impacts your brain. And this is a summary of many, many studies that we have done and other colleagues have done. And we have found that the nutrients to the left increase brain aging and increase risk of dementia later on in life. These are broadly fats, like trans fats, saturated fat, and cholesterol. These, these fats can't get inside your brain, but they do affect heart health in so many people. And what is bad for your heart really is bad for your brain. We see it on brain scans all the time. And then we have excess sodium. It gives you hypertension that also affects your heart. And trace minerals like iron, copper, and zinc. Too many increase oxidation and free radicals inside your brain that uh, accelerates cellular aging. Now to the right, those are the nutrients that are actually really good for you. Your brain wants them and needs them, and they're protective against cognitive decline. They really actually support cognitive function at any stage of life. These are omega-3 polyunsaturated fats. They're called, they're mostly from fish, fatty fish. Um, there's the selenium. It's a strong antioxidant. You can find it in Brazil nuts. Uh, a little bit of copper and zinc, but mostly antioxidant vitamins, vitamin A, C, E, and carotenoids. You need to eat them. They're from plants. They're good for you, veggies and fruits. And B vitamins, like B6, B12, and folate, are crucial for a healthy nervous system. We have to eat these, these nutrients every day. How do we do that? Through the diet. People eat foods, not nutrients. And these are really like contrasting the Western diet to a Mediterranean-style diet. Full disclosure, I'm Italian. But uh, <laughs> I'm biased, but this comes up in the research all the time. So a Western diet is the way people eat in the United States. 
fast food, processed food, meat and dairy, refined sugar, and soda. Not good for you. The Mediterranean diet is kind of the opposite, and it's like lots of veggies and fruit, whole grains, fish, legumes, and a little bit of red wine. I think the northern diet is somewhere in between. You guys have wonderful fish, but I, I, I have seen a lot of Burger Kings and fast food. And I say, go TGI Fridays, something like that. I was around the corner. Uh, so when I say that this diet, the Mediterranean diet, is good for you, I'm actually going to show you what I mean. These are brain scans. This is a brain. This is an MRI scan of a woman who was 52 years old when she came to work with me for the first time in 2014. And this is the way you want your brain to look like when you're 52 years old. This is the perfect brain. If you can see these little fissures inside the brain, they like a little bit like a little butterfly. Those are called ventricles. You want them to be really nice and tight. Everything that looks black on this specific MRI sequence is fluid. If you have a lot of fluid, it means you don't have a lot of brain. So you want to maximize brain, <laughs> minimize fluid. So you want your brain to really touch the skull. And the skull is the thin layer of white bone around the head, right? So you want your brain to be as close as possible to that, to have as little black as possible. Now, let me show you the typical Western diet brain. This is a lady who was slightly younger, 50 years old, when she came to us. I think you can see immediately that the ventricles are larger, right? There's a lot more black inside her head, and that means the fluid is taking over. Wherever the arrows point to, those are the memory centers of the brain, and they're surrounded by black. That means that the memory centers are shrinking. We call it atrophy, and it's a very strong risk factor for future Alzheimer's. Now, this woman was 50 years old, and this is not a healthy brain. No, it's not just these two women, of course. We have seen hundreds and hundreds of patients. And broadly, what you see is that the Western diet makes your brain age faster. So if you look at the Western dieters in blue, as compared to the Mediterranean-style dieters, they're American, um, you can see the blue guys, the Western dieters, decline on top. And that's brain activity going down over time, year after year. And at the bottom, they start accumulating Alzheimer's plaques. And these people are in their 40s, 40s and 50s, whereas those who follow healthy diets remain broadly stable over time. So overall, the Western diet uh, accelerates brain aging, and that's definitely a risk factor for future cognitive impairment, if not dementia. And I want to conclude, because we're talking about synthetic biology, um, a problem with the Western diet is the quality of the foods that we eat. We have all these unnatural substances, like transaturated fats that were not made by nature, they were made by men, and they just don't work. They increase, they double your risk of dementia. And it's not just that, it's everything else we have in the environment. It's the way our food is packaged, it's all the pesticides, and it's the fact that we're literally drowning in plastic. And I'm not just being new agey here, it's more than plastic and a lot of synthetic substances contain something called xenoestrogens. That means foreign estrogens. So these are chemicals that, once you put them inside your body, they mimic the effects of our, of our hormones, like the estrogens. And they have been flagged by the American Neuroendocrine Society as neuroendocrine disruptors. So even, even Western medicine acknowledges that they mess up your brain and your hormones at the same time. So it's really something we don't want. In the fine print, if you can read this, and does your toothpaste contain titanium? You will not believe how common it is. If you look at the ingredients, many common toothpastes contain titanium. You don't want that in your mouth. So what are you going to have for dinner? <laughs> what would you feed your family, your friends, Europe, or the world? I think a lot about this, of course. Like Kevin mentioned, I, I wrote a book about it. But regardless of that, if you're interested, I would love to connect. And if you have any questions, that's, I'll be here um, today. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. <laughs>